American police officer in the late 70s. He infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan. He seemingly, this seemingly impossible story became a best-selling book and was the inspiration for the award-winning film Black Klansman. Please welcome Ron Stallworth. Hi, Ron. <laughs> So good to have you here. You were actually born in Chicago. I was, 1953, Great Lakes Naval Hospital. Wow, how many years did you spend here before moving to El Paso, Texas? Four years, I lived at the old Ida B. Wells housing project wow. uh, before we moved to uh, El Paso. Okay. Good for you. Yeah. Say, uh, let, let me just say right off the top, uh, it's a wonderful movie, by the way. Black Klansman turned out wonderfully. The book was also good. I had read it some time ago. Let me just start by saying, the idea of a black guy infiltrating the KKK just ain't a good idea <laughs> <laughs> to start with. How in the world did you come up with this? I was young, full of piss and vinegar, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I had to come up with something on the spur of the moment, and that's what I did. Well, I mean, what made you even come up with that idea? How come you didn't come up with something different? I couldn't, because uh, when the phone call was taking place, and uh, I was invited to go meet him. Obviously, because I was blessed with this beautiful skin, I couldn't do that. So I had to come up with a plan, and my plan was to orchestrate everything and send a white officer posing as me. So you get, you get a strange phone call where you involve yourself with the KKK, and it turns out you actually get to meet with them. You know you can't do that. You find a white guy who has to know everything you've said to them, and then he goes to the meeting, and then you have to know everything that happened in that conversation, and you begin to build this structure where he, you're like, you're like living in a parallel universe here. <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting time. We had to know, at every, mo at every moment, we had to know what each other was saying. Uh, when I was talking on the phone to these guys, I would tell Chuck, in the book, in the movie, he's Adam's, Adam Driver as Flip Zimmerman. Uh, I had to tell Chuck what I had said on the phone. When I would send Chuck in to a meeting, I had him wired for sound, so I would listen in to his conversations, and I would know what Chuck was saying to them. Um, so we would go back and forth, never skipping a beat, and they were too dumb to realize that they were talking to two different people. You know, you know something. You know, this, we, we, and, and I, we need to also set the stage. This is, this is a t period of time when the KKK is not only still killing people in America in, in, in fairly public cases at the time, but in addition, uh, on the other side, there were African-American uh, militants and activists, including Stokely Carmichael, who you personally met. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Stokely was very clear to you about what he thought the future might include. Yeah, he said a race war where that we as black people were going to have to go out and kill Whitey. And he uh, told me to, uh, he said, arm yourself, because uh, we're going to have to go kill Whitey. So this was 1978, 79. Um, the interesting thing about this is that we are living in a time right now where we have a gentleman in the White House who is stoking all these fears. And you all know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not Obama. Um, but he's stoking all these fears, and he is planting the seeds for what could become a race war. Were you ever scared? Never. Never. I, I was a trained undercover investigator. We don't get scared. We do our job. <laughs> and we, we do our job. We do it with the understanding that there are dangers there that are, can prop up at any time. and. Uh, we just uh, plow through them. Why do you feel like your story has not come out sooner? Why, why now? When the investigation ended, I was ordered by my chief not to talk to the, to the media or anybody about it. People within the department knew what was going on, but not to talk to anyone else. So I didn't. Um, I ended this investigation and I went on to something else. Yeah. And I stayed with the department for a year before I left and moved on with my career. And you still have your KK card? I carry it with me all the time. Can I see it? <laughs> wow. Now, you not only have a card, you, you met the Klan leader, David Duke. I not only have a card, I have a certificate of membership, and I did meet and uh, was the bodyguard of David Duke. Isn't that something? And, and David Duke actually called you before the movie came out to wonder how he was being portrayed. Is that true? 
He called me one hour before, or one day, one week, I'm sorry, before the uh, movie premiere in August of uh, 2018. Uh, wanted to voice his uh, concern about how he was going to be portrayed in the movie based on the trailer that had come out. Uh -huh. And um, what was that conversation like? We had an hour long conversation. He called the uh, minute I heard his voice. It's like 40 years had never passed. I, I knew who he was. He said, Ron. I said, hey, David, what's up? So he just had your phone number still or how, how did he even? No, he had my phone number. My phone, it's not hard to get in touch with me if you really want to find me. I'm not hiding. I don't hide from the Klan or anybody else. Uh -huh. And uh, he managed to get my number and gave me a call. And we talked for about an hour. Uh, he told me that uh, he liked my book. He uh, respected me. Uh, his recollections, he said, were a little bit different, but he recognized the truth of what I was saying, and he wanted me to know that. Um, he said he was going to tell his podcast listeners to buy my book. And he told me that he liked the works of Spike Lee. <laughs> what? <laughs> Especially Malcolm X. Really? And that he was going to recommend his podcast listeners uh, go watch Malcolm X, and uh, not go watch uh, Black Klansman, and judge for themselves whether or not uh, I was telling the truth. Interestingly enough, one of the things he said to me was that, like Malcolm, he believed that blacks should have a separate homeland away from whites. And I told him, I said, yes, Malcolm did advocate that. But Malcolm eventually went to Mecca, came back after experiencing the humanity of man. Yeah. Malcolm then believed that all men could live and should live together. Right. I said, Malcolm evolved. You haven't. Right. What did he say to that? When I told him that, he changed the subject, didn't want to talk about it. He did that a lot during our hour-long conversation. He did not want to talk about something that he had been cornered on when the facts did not work out to his favor. He, didn't, he, he insisted he was not a racist or a white supremacist. What does he think he is? When I pointed out that he was a racist and a white supremacist <laughs> and that Donald Trump was too, based on how he was advocating similar beliefs that uh, David was, David, David told me that he was not, all he believed in is that whites should live for, for whites or stand for white rights, and blacks should do the same for themselves. Uh, and he said Trump was doing the same on behalf of whites. And I told him if, uh, if that is not an, an act of white supremacy, why is it that you want to close down the southern border where brown people are coming in, but leave the northern border where white Canadians live open? I said, explain that to me. He changed the subject. You have had a fascinating wow. experience, a great book, a great movie. If you haven't read it or seen it, I recommend it. Ron Stallworth, we appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you for being Thank here. You.